Shut up and sit down. Brian Kudekuds, the Packers general manager here on Inside Wisconsin. Brian, you are a busy guy. Thanks for taking some time to chat with us. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, John, tell the story about the jersey. Get it out of the way because I am so jealous of that 34 on your chest. It's not even funny. (laughs) Is it the number or is it the jersey? It's who sent you the jersey. Like Brian Gutekun sent you a jersey to your house. I I was I'm jealous. Well, it I'm says jealous. Like, I'm going to ask Brian because I know how these things work. A lot of times, I'm sure get things get passed in front of you. Here, sign <laughs> this, please. I don't know if it's your handwriting; it could be your executive assistant, whatever it is. Uh, but uh, I, I appreciate this. It's a good look. I like the all green. I'm yeah. better. I'm better with the all white, but I can live with this. It's fun. Um, so yeah, my thanks. And also, please just don't tell me you made the mistake. Like this was supposed to go to the other John Anderson. I have to get. <laughs> No, no, uh, my executive Kelly did put it in front of me, and uh, okay, but uh, no, I was glad to do it. I actually think you know this is a new jersey we're wearing this year, and it is it is pretty sharp. So, yeah, because I get the other stuff all the time. I have to send back John Anderson's NFL pension <laughs> stuff. All the time. Like, this is the wrong dude, man. Not me. You know, I, I'll be honest. I kept I kept the all '80s team linebacker plaque that still hangs up here. That yeah. one he does. He's not even gonna know he missed it, but. But a lot of times I'm asked to return shit, which is too, too bad. I, I don't I don't get a lot of that with my last name, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How often is that? How often does that get butchered? Oh, uh, pretty much regularly, and and I don't understand it because it's just how it's spelled. You know what I mean? So it's uh, but it's uh, pretty regularly. That's for sure. Yeah. And and do the envelopes come that way too? The envelopes come misspelled. And oh yeah, it's always that. that it's always that extra n. You know, it's G U T E, and they always put that extra n in there. But there's Good. there's no n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have that problem now, right? Uh, after this summer, pretty much everybody knows your name. Unfortunately, yes. And how yeah. it is. So, no. uh, yeah. How so? How are things in the building right now? Like, if you're if you're just to assess how how things are now, that it appears at least things have have settled and mm-hmm. we're into some sort of normal routine. Uh, how are things? It's great. No, I mean, obviously, I think you know when you're in the off season and your focus is away from the actual football, sometimes I think things can get a little sideways like they did, but at the same time, once everybody gets back in the building and we're working towards the same thing and the same cause, I think, uh, you know, everything gets back in, uh, in alignment. So no, really excited. I'm really excited about our team. Um, you know, we're coming up here to the last preseason game and, um, you know, trying to stay as healthy as we can before new Orleans. But I think uh, everybody's really excited to, uh, to get to it. So, Brian, Inside Wisconsin is all about the people, the stories, and the statriotism of America's dairy land. <laughs> I joke with my wife, Amanda, because John, Brian, and I have – our sons are in the same class in school. Mm-hmm. And uh, I joke with her a lot. Back in 2018, when you were announced as general manager, I looked at Amanda, and I'm like, well, there went Daddy Career Day. Because <laughs> uh, somebody just won all of them sure. for the rest yeah. of our time together. So <laughs> – I want to know, though, in that moment, I remember vividly you and Mark Murphy had this exchange during your press conference where you said it was always Green Bay. I always wanted to be in Green Bay. And Mark looked at you as if your agent led him to believe that that was not the case. And that's what a good agent's supposed to do. But what was it about Green Bay, about raising a family here? You've been here forever. Just tell us about what it is for you in Wisconsin. Sure. Well, first of all, I've been blessed to be part of this organization it's really since the summer of 1997. Uh, I interned here um, right after they had won the Super Bowl uh, at that, that 97 training camp um, before I spent about a year in Kansas City before I came back. So I've been here a long time. And uh, just my family uh, has just been blessed by this organization Um for so long and it's such an important part of my life. But my wife's from Menasha, Wisconsin. She's born and raised here. Uh, her whole family's from here. Um, I went to high school in Minneapolis and then went to you know college at the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. So uh, Wisconsin has been kind of near and dear to my heart uh, for a long, long time. And as we were going through that process, um, you really never know what's gonna happen, but the opportunity to stay here um, was certainly something that was extremely important to me and, and my wife and, and my family. So then uh, you went to school in the Twin Cities and your wife is from the Twin Cities. Because I tell people all the time, Nina Menasha, if you don't know, those are actually the Twin Cities. <laughs> no doubt. No, I've learned that along the way. I don't think I knew that originally, but I've learned that along the way. Don't yeah, mess with the Blue Jays. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a strong allegiance right there. So, Give me what is unique then about the Packer franchise and the setup that you have. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
because it is unlike everything else. There are times I'm sure it works for you. I'm sure there are times that it works against you. But just um, lay it out for people that is why your job is unique as a GM as to other people who have the same title in the NFL but work in a different yeah. franchise. Oh, obviously, certainly the biggest thing is we don't have a traditional owner. Um, we have a board of directors that – uh, elects an executive board, which you know elects a, a president who's Mark Murphy, who kind of acts as our owner. So it's different than really other, any other franchise that uh, in the National Football League. Um, I also think the investment of the fans into this um, into this team is just different. Uh, obviously, they're shareholders, and and everybody you know knows a lot about um, that. But I think this is as close to a college SEC Big Ten feel as there is in the National Football League, and I just think it's special. Um, you know, I think everything that we do here goes back into winning into the football team. And I don't know if every franchise can say that. Um, every decision we make, um, all the resources we have go into supporting this, these, this team and this, these players to go out there and accomplish, um, you know, the, the goal of winning a, a Super Bowl. So um, not every team is, is aligned that way. And um, certainly not every team has the resources provided to do that. So I think it's just a special place. Um, you know, personally, I love it because it's uh, in the National Football League to be able to drive, you know, from your house to, to work in 10 minutes and get home after game day in 20 minutes is unusual. And uh, to be able to raise a family um, in, a, in a small town city with the field that this place has is just there's not there's no other opportunity in the National Football League to do so. Have you guys been approached by the SEC yet to join along with Oklahoma and Texas? <laughs> no, but we will, we're, we're listening to all offers. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you mentioned it earlier, UW Lacrosse. That's where you got bit by the non-playing side of football, no different than what your dad was up to those days, obviously. But what was it at lacrosse? You had a shoulder injury. You were playing there, D3, and then I think you won a ring with them as an assistant coach, did you not? I did. So, I again, just – you look back in your in your kind of life career, you know, how everything unfolded and you just feel so blessed. But I got to be around a guy named Roger Herring and he had a defensive coordinator named Roland Christensen. And they had had tremendous success at the University of Wisconsin lacrosse. I think they were there together about 30 some years, maybe had one losing season, three national championships, one that I got to be a part of. Roger actually just passed away about uh, a week ago. And um, but his the impact he had on so many that went through that program, including myself, just can't be measured. For me, after I got done playing and couldn't play anymore, I kind of was looking to get back to North Carolina, which is home for me. Um, and Roger just said, no, <laughs> he said, you're going <laughs> to you're going to stay here and you owe me and you're going to be an assistant coach and help me. And um, that was probably, you know, one of the more important um, decisions in my life as far as my path, because getting to be around those guys, obviously my dad was a football coach and knows more about the game than anyone that I've ever been around. But being around Roger and Roland and that program, um, I think, allowed me to look at, uh, you know, a, an afterlife of playing um, that, again, I didn't know scouting was going to be in my in my future, but uh coaching or scouting, but being around the game and, and having a career that way. So uh, I owe so much to that place and, and those, those men there. You mentioned uh, Coach Herring passing away. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was nice. Like I thought he got his due, which for a, a Division three coach, even with that kind of success, sometimes that, that, um, that can escape people. But I thought yeah. he was really recognized for his career. Give me something, though. Give me a lesson or two. Uh, cause I, I bore Trevor with lessons I got from my college track coach all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but that just kind of shows up in your daily routine or that shows up that is, um, an influence on you that in some way influences the green Bay Packers every day. Yeah. I know for me it was that, that, that coach Herring, I mean, he found value in everyone. Um, you know, whether it was, um, you know, people helping out in the equipment room or the training room or uh, all the players in the team, no matter what their role was, he found value in everyone, I think. And he made you feel that way, um, which is unique. Uh, and then especially in um, with as many players that he had, I mean, we would start out every year with about 200. And I think after the first meeting, we were about down to two, 175, but, uh, but he, he just, he believed in people and he believed in kind of putting them in places and letting them grow. He also, I think, you know, he had a Marine background, I believed in toughness and hard work and physicality. And um, he always thought the harder you made training camp and practices that the cream would kind of rise to the top. And that was kind of his philosophy. And um, But just a, just a great man. And uh, I think the one, the impact that I early on when I was there that I saw with, 
was how many high school coaches and and people in the community, not just in the lacrosse area, but throughout the state, um, had so many ties to him. And um, it, like whenever we were recruiting, he didn't like to go to the schools. He'd just pick up the phone and call the coach because somewhere along the way he either coached him or had some kind of experience with him. And um, so that was, you know, growing up in a Division One coaching household where your dad was gone on the road recruiting all the time, that was kind of different. He would always tell me when I would want to go out and – visit some of these players he's like why would you go visit them they're coming here you know so um <laughs> very unique man so it's awesome to hear you talk about a mentor in lacrosse and i know there's another one that you unfortunately lost over the last year or so and it's ted thompson mm -hmm. um he thought the world of you brian and clearly believed in what you were able to do for the packers what was ted thompson's favorite thing about working for the green bay packers and living here in wisconsin i know he was here in deep here where i live um, cause let's be honest, he didn't tell us any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ted loved this place. He loved, uh, he, he, he loved, I think this organization and the players, um, more than he ever let on. He just was not that he was not someone who, uh, wore things on his sleeve or was very, um, he didn't communicate those things all the time, but he, he loved the green Bay Packers. He loved this building. <laughs> he loved the people in it. Um, I think it would take, people about three years before they felt they could even approach him sometimes just because of the <laughs> way he was. Uh, but once you kind of were one of his guys, that was going to last a long time. And um, the thing I learned so many things from him from a scouting perspective and, and just from, you know, all different walks of life. But the thing that, that I never, never left him through all around all of us was the fact that it was about the players, you know, it was about those guys on the field and uh, we, I don't think we've ever lost sight of that. It's um, that's the most important thing here. It's always been that way. And um, him being a former player himself, playing ten years in the league, I think that was um, that was something that uh, he always would preach to us um, once you kind of got into his inner circle. Oh. <laughs> so I'm sitting here in Connecticut, and kind of chuckling at that because my dad, who is uh, who, by the way, who would have been uh, 90, 90 years old on this day. Oh. was one of these guys that started from uh, being a, a hood rat that snuck under the field at City <laughs> Stadium, yeah. to eventually having success and sitting up in, in one of the club seats. But he is he was one of the original Packer guys, like you found 100 times, I can't believe we're letting Brett Favre walk and bringing Aaron Rodgers, right? right. And so now he at his funeral, he's passed away. I'm at Lindall's, right? So I'm just on the corner there. And I said, yeah. now somebody can go over and Ted, tell, tell Ted Thompson he's off the hook. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, and I can still hear him saying to me, I don't know why they just didn't tell us right away that Aaron would be this good. Then we wouldn't have had the weeping and gnashing of teeth, to which right. I said, no, they tried really hard to tell you he was going to be this good, right? Yeah. That's part of the reason that was happening. We're kind of reliving this in some thing and that we're trying to uh, protect the football team long term at a position mm -hmm. that's really hard. Um, but what have we learned going through this? Because you saw it the first time, and now mm -hmm. as you are in sort of um, uh, a bigger chair as this goes through, you know, what are the lessons that come out of this that that benefit you and eventually benefit the the franchise? Yeah, I think I, I wasn't super close to it when when Ted went through the the Brett Favre um, thing. I, I was on the staff and had a few conversations with him about it as he went through. But I wasn't, and I was here during training camp during that uh, that year. But um, wasn't as close to it as, as certainly the conversations that were ha you know being had then as I am now. I will say the one thing that that I remember Ted did tell me when he was going through it was he was just trying to figure out and do what was right for the Green Bay Packers and the player. And then and by the player meant being Brett. Um, he just, he really cared about that. And I think at times those two things were at odds a little bit. And it was, I think it took a toll on him, but he really did care about doing what was right for the organization first and then the player as well. So, and I think as I went through this year with, with Mark and, and Matt and Russ and all the things we went through with Aaron, like, I think, that was the one thing that was on my mind was let's we have to do what is right for the organization and try to do what's right for the player as well. And um, again, I think the one thing that, that i never loved, really lost sight of was the fact that I think we were all aligned in what we wanted to do, which was get back here and win a championship in green Bay. Um, we had some hurdles we had to get through to get there, but um, I was always confident in that. And um, at the end of the day, I think that's, that's all you can really do is, is you look at your organization, look at your team and, and, and try to do what's very best for them and then, um, you know, sometimes you're going to be right. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. 
But at the same time, I think you can never lose sight of that. That's interesting that you bring up the human element side of this, right? Because so many times that's get that gets lost, right? You're the general manager of the Green Bay Packers. You're a title. You're a position. Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. In a lot of cases, he's a title. He's a position. And and when these conversations happen, the the human element seems to sometimes get lost when opinions start flying all over the place. I will never forget. Uh, there was a day last April, Brian, you and I haven't even talked about this. Uh, your son, my son, hang out at school. My son comes home and goes, Dad, uh, they might have to move. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think that's going to happen, bud. But yeah, you know, and, and people don't think that stuff through. So what's it like sitting in that chair as a human being, as a dad, as a husband, as a community member? That's that's tough sled. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I have a unique perspective I, just because I grew up in it. Uh, my father was a college football coach who we moved a few times when I was growing up and you kind of lived on Saturdays, right? They meant everything. Wins and losses meant something. You were always well aware as a kid that, you know, if we, if you weren't winning, that that could happen. Um, and quite frankly, when you get into the NFL, you don't think, hey, you're going to be someplace for 20 some years, right? You don't really, yeah. that's not the way it works. So um, we've been blessed to be here for as long as we've been here. And, uh, but that's not normal in the national football league at the same time when you have really good players and really good quarterbacks you tend to stick around a little bit longer than if you don't so obviously that's really really important um but i think it's it's a little tougher on the families probably than than us that are working actually in the in the profession just because we're so aware of that from from week to week and, and how sure. this league is and you see it every year and um you know how things happen so it's just kind of part of it and um you know, I think you, you can't uh, you got to kind of block out the irrelevant noise for the for the most part, because it's it's all around us now. Right. And I think if, yeah. uh, if you allow that stuff to kind of bleed into your your thought process, then it's it's, it's never a positive. I feel like no that's sleep. a shot that just came over my ESPN bow, but that's OK. I can I can I can handle it. Listen, the best thing that happens, though, is that you finally get to have training camp and there's things yes. other things to talk about. Right. I get that all the time. I tell people here, I tell coaches the first thing, take your kids off the street, make sure every kid or player you have is not doing something stupid the day after the all-star game because nothing's yeah. happening. So if you jaywalk, it's going to make TV. Correct. Um, and so, right, leading up until somebody actually gets on the field or any of the franchises and we have something else to talk about, even if it's how many passes you complete in seven on seven drill, there's all kinds of space there that needs to be filled. So, and by the time you get to play, everybody's like, wait, there, oh yeah, oh that's right. We I don't even remember what we were talking about. I'm not <laughs> sure you're ever going to get that far away from it, but it certainly right. it does help. You're in a spot too where like you have only so many jobs that you can have, right? Mm -hmm. If you go down to it, it, whatever whatever Ford Howard is now these days, it shows that I haven't been around <laughs> a long. Time. But it, but if things are good, we can yeah. have jobs, right? right? We can grow. We like you don't get to do that. You have mm -hmm. X number of jobs that you can have only. And that makes life really difficult when it comes through. If I went into your top drawer, do you have a list of guys ready that are play, or do you have your board over there because, um, right, you're, you're one wrong cut from needing another tackle, another yeah. linebacker? How do, how do I keep track of – how do I stay right on the edge of what I need to know and have that ready for those coveted spots on my roster? Yeah, so we obviously – I mean, we have a, a huge personnel department here. There's some guys that are kind of more strictly college on the road and working the college draft. And then we have a, a staff here that that is here every day that's working on the rest of the league. Uh, and we have, you know, some get teams call it a ready list. We call it an emergency list. Um, and we keep that board. We meet on it every day. In fact, that's my nine o'clock meeting this morning is we'll meet on the emergency board. And as players get released, um, players that are already on the street, um, as we go through these cuts over the next week, that's how we kind of build our emergency board. And um, we're always kind of looking to see how we can strengthen the back end of our roster. That goes on 365 days a year. Um, mm -hmm. And it you know gets a lot more attention during the draft and free agency and things like that. But this is um, something that Ron Wolf, Ted Thompson have passed down here. We, we It's nonstop. I mean, we, had, we signed two players this morning. So um, it's something that we very much believe in. You have to kind of turn the bottom of that roster. Um, and that's how you find guys like Bobby Tanyan and uh, Shannon Sullivan and, and guys that become impact players for you. Uh, if you don't, if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to find those guys. That's our cue that we only got a few minutes left with Brian Gutekunst, by the yep. way, just a heads up, because he is not going to be late to that meeting on our behalf. That's for damn sure. <laughs> hey, uh, 
usually we do a little bit of a lightning round at the end of these conversations. I might make John proud right now. Check this out, John. Hey, Brian, okay. what's the best 80s band ever? Go. Ooh, that's pretty tough. Uh, there's so many of them because I am probably more well-versed in 80s music than football. Uh, <laughs> wow. this, is, this is a little bit of just a personal thing, but Def Leppard. Def Leppard. Have you seen them? Uh, three times, yes. Don't tell my mom. That was, a couple of times I wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned a few years back that you grabbed a couple lining kugels out of your fridge before you went in after mm -hmm. the draft. What's in the fridge now? Uh, we're sponsored by Miller Lite, so definitely Miller Lite, a lot of that. <laughs> and uh, uh, I do like a spotted cow now and again. So We're trying to be sponsored by either of them, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> John, anything else to add? Uh, I want to know what's the most prized possession in your in your office sitting there. If there's a fire, what are you running out with? Oof, if there's a fire, what am I running out with? Um, probably either my lacrosse helmet, my – Picture of the Hanson brothers or um, the pictures of my kids. So those those three things. Well, in that case, give me give me the best line from Slapshot. Oh, I can't say those words on this. Can I say those words on here? Yeah, you can. I mean, we'll believe them out if we have. <laughs> no, I don't. We don't want to. We don't want to put you. Know, you. Can you describe the situation? And I'll tell you. So, well, my favorite scene is when um, the general manager is making them do the fashion show. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I definitely can't say those words on TV. <laughs> but that's my favorite well, scene for sure. Well, I tell you what, we'll add the scream though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll add the screen. So, do you ever then in the national anthem, do you ever turn to the ref and tell him you're trying to listen to the effing song? Um, I think about it on occasion, but I don't actually do that. No. <laughs> He's a great guy that played for the uh, the the St. Louis Blues and for the uh, Winnipeg Jets and the Coyotes. Uh, Keith Kachuk, they called him Walt Kachuk. He, he, Walt could do every single line. I mean, he was great. He might as well have been Reg Murphy yeah. uh, when he came through. He was great. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, well, so we here's probably have to let you go find players. Otherwise, this could just go on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, it, right. It, it, listen, it's compelling stuff. It is. It's a job that's uh, unique. It is a job that I don't think anybody fully understands what it is. Um, I always say people don't want their people don't want the best team to win. They want their team to win. Right. And it's that way with players too. They don't always want the best player at the position. They want the player they like the best. Yeah. Um, there. So, and you know, you don't know what it is if it's a third team long snapper. Or, or any of those guys. It's a, it's a tough it's a tough gig, and uh, we appreciate the job you've done there. And thanks for coming on, and I appreciate it. And don't think for a minute that I'm not going to hold this over Trevor's head for the next <laughs> God knows how long. This will be fantastic. Yeah, so, well, I, I appreciate you guys having me. Um, you know, I'll say this one day I'm going to have to get a real job, but um, while I got this one, I'm going to enjoy it. That's for sure. No way. Amen. <laughs> All right, thanks, Brian. Man. Cheers, man. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks. Helpful critiques, ideas, great stories, people we should know, the great bar in your town, the fish fry that you want to know, the fish boil, anything that you want to reach out to us with, we are happy, we are here. You can be the inputters. We're here to listen. Shut up and sit down.